All right. Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast our show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing today, and we then post the recording onto our Encompass Live website for you to watch at your convenience. Um, and I will show you um, at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives on our website. Um, for those of you not from Nebraska, uh, the Nebraska Library Commission, we're based here in Lincoln, Nebraska, the capital, and we are the state agency for all libraries in the state. In other states across the country, sometimes it's your, you know, so-and-so state library. We're the same um, um, uh, state arm of the state government for Nebraska. So we officially serve all types of libraries. So um, you will find things on our show for public libraries, academics, K-12, uh, museums, schools, uh, correction facilities, anything that has a library in it, we would potentially have a topic for. Um, we are across, totally across the board with that. So you'll find all sorts of things out there. Um, so hopefully something that you <laughs> will find of interest. Um, we do um, all of our, both our live shows and our archived recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think that might have an interest in any of the topics we have coming up on our schedule or any of our archives. Um, and we do a mixture of types of things here on the show too. We do book review sessions, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products, um, interviews with people, related to libraries. Um, sometimes we do um, have things that are, uh, the, the people presenting are here from the Library Commission about services and products that we offer here. I think you should be using here locally in Nebraska. Um, but we do bring in guest speakers from all over the country um, and even from outside of the U.S. And uh, that's what we have with us today um, on Live is, is Patrick Bodley. Good morning, Patrick. Morning, everyone. He is from the Idaho Commission for Libraries. And what is your actual what was it, library consultant state data coordinator? So you get two yep. titles. Yes. <laughs> um, so he is um, um, just a little, you know, west of us here by a bit. Um, and he is, um, this is a session that you did, I know you've, I believe you've done it multiple times. Yeah. Or so I did it, I did it at our state library conference, um, mm -hmm. Idaho Library Association. I presented at the Pacific Northwest Library Association on the same thing, and then also at the Association of Rural and Small Libraries that was held in Vermont this year. Right, which is where I saw that it was done. I wasn't able to attend that session. There was two, so lots of good sessions, but um, mm -hmm. that's one of the great things about being the host of my own, this um, webinar show here. If I miss a session, I can just have them come on the show, and I guess <laughs> why don't you find out what you had said that way? So um, I saw this was on the, the agenda as you said for the ARSL, and I thought it was perfect. There are, especially here in Nebraska, and I'm sure in Idaho and across the country, lots of our small rural libraries are in this situation. We have a library, someone needs to run it, poof, it's you. <laughs> yep. Now, how are you gonna do that? Yeah. Um, so um, we're gonna talk about that today. So I think I'll just hand it over to you, Patrick, to um, start off. I do have, whenever you want to, that uh, little poll is set up here. Perfect, that was so. gonna be my first question. Um, so we wanted to start off just with this poll to see how many of our attendees, if you want to just pop it up, I just want to see who was from where. So what type of acad academic librarians, school librarians, special, who is who is here? There we go. There you go, you should, so you guys should see a poll now on your screen. Yep, people are answering, awesome. So we'll leave that up for a couple of sec a minute or two here. We can get um, all of your answers. Well, you guys are fast. Ninety-four percent of attendees have already voted. Awesome. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's like you know, drag them kicking and screaming. Now, if you are an other, go ahead and type into your question section. And let us know what that might mean. So far, nobody has picked other that they apparently do fit into any of these categories we had suggested. But just in case, um, we want to know what that might be. There might be a couple more people that we're waiting for. I'll give another second or two, 
and then we can look at all right i'm going to close the poll in five four three two one and uh, there are our results mostly public 70% of you are from public libraries, 18% academic or college, and then we've got special institutional or government libraries. Okay, gotcha. No schools on the line today. Um, that's okay. We like them anyway. That's, no. <laughs> that's okay, yeah. The, the reason why I wanted to ask that is because this is, uh, my background's more on the public side of things. This has been, mm -hmm. I've, in listening to people sit in, uh, I've presented to academic and school librarians as well. Um, and it, they've found it useful, but this is geared more towards uh, the public side of things. So that's the whole reason that that's going on there. Um, also, we didn't set up a poll, but uh, if we could get everyone to raise their hand, I'm interested in, if you would raise your hand, how many of you currently have uh, an MLS or an MLIS or MILS or whatever the acronym you want to use. Whatever whatever acronym your degree gave you. <laughs> yeah. Right, let's see here. So you can go into your go to webinar interface to do a little hand raising. See, we've got 36 logins, people, locations logged in right now, and I'm seeing um, one, two, three, four, six hands raised. All right, you six. Seven. Uh, seven, however many yeah. still. How many of you started your library career, keep your hand raised with that MLS? Uh, if you started your library career and then went back to get your degree, go ahead and put your hand down. Ah. At least five. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So that is normal. That's all I yeah. wanted to talk about is that that is absolutely normal. Um, I myself didn't plan on being a librarian. Um, and so today, since we're going to talk about uh, what an accidental librarian is, um, since we're going to talk about what an accidental librarian is, uh, if we want to survive and thrive, we should determine what that accidental librarian is. Um, I know people are familiar with Dr. Carla Hayden. Uh, she is important for a number of various reasons, uh, but one of the reasons that she is so, uh, I guess, so rare, so important as the Librarian of Congress is that she is the first Librarian of Congress who has an MLS, which mm. means that in the history of our country, of the United States anyway, everyone who was a librarian of Congress did not have a library degree, uh, which to me means if they can run the entire Library of Congress, we can run our libraries as well. <laughs> um, another example, uh, besides Dr. Carla Hayden, is this bright-eyed, baby-faced hero, which means a whole lot more if you remember my scruffy, homeless-looking face now. Um, but this is me, and I want to tell you a little bit about my story to let you know where I'm coming from. Um, my journey to librarianship started at uh, this place, which I'm sure no one is familiar with. This is a building in Logan, Utah called Youth Track, Utah. And what it is, is a group home for juvenile male sex offenders. And this is where I was working when I was uh, going to, working on my undergrad degree uh, in history. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew 100% that this was a job, it was not a career. Uh, I did not have the patience or the tolerance to be a social worker or a case manager or anything like that. But while I was going to Utah State, uh, I fell in love with the history program I was in. Uh, I loved going into the archives. I loved doing research. I loved reading and writing papers. And I had an advisor, Dr. Rosenband, who asked me, like most good advisors do, what are you going to do with a history degree? What are you going to do after you're done with this? Uh, and I looked him square in the eyes and I told him, you know, Dr. Rosenband, I am I, I love the history side of things. I, I want to go on. I'm going to get my master's and then my PhD in history. I'll try and get a professorship somewhere and I will teach history for the rest of my life. And bless him, Dr. Rosenman looked at me and said, Patrick, that is the dumbest idea 
you've ever had. Uh, do not do that. Why do you like history? And I told him the same reasons that I just told you, that I loved research, that I loved uh, hanging out in the archives. And he said, you know, if that's what you love doing, you should look at getting a dual master's in history and library science. There are tons of schools across the country that will offer you those two masters. You would be doubly employable. You could maybe teach on the side, but you could work in the archives somewhere doing what you really love. And so look for library jobs to get experience, uh, go on and do things just like that. And so luckily in my senior year of undergrad, uh, a job opened up at the Merrill Kazir Library at Utah State University. That's the giant library that's on our screen right now. Oh. Um, and so I applied as a, they, they were looking for a student supervisor and the course reserve supervisor. Uh, it was kind of a dual position and I applied. Uh, luckily, they were only looking for something with supervisor experience. And when I'd been at that group home, that Youth Track Utah, I was the supervisor and set the schedule for all the staff. So they looked at that at USU and said, perfect. Uh, while I was there at USU, I learned to love libraries um, and I learned all the important things, you know, I learned since I was working in course reserves that collection development was as easy as anything in the world uh, because all course, all collection development was, was when a professor wanted something, you put it on and when he wanted it off, you took it off of course reserves. That's all that uh, had to be uh, worked more with uh, the public, obviously, and, and really I just fell in love with libraries that way. Um, and then I realized I was still going to apply for that, those master's programs uh, in library science and uh, my MA in history. Uh, and I applied to various programs. I applied to University of Arizona and SUNY Albany and Wisconsin, Milwaukee and Indiana and got accepted to uh, one of those and was ready to go. And about that time, my wife and I were expecting a child. And so rather than move across the country, uh, the plan was that we would stay at USU where I was lucky enough to have benefits, uh, including health insurance, to have that baby there. And I started working on my master's in history uh, just at USU, thinking that if it was a three-year program for a dual master's and I had to take a year off, I could just do the two years at USU and then two years somewhere else, I was still going to take the same amount of time, uh, four years either way. And so towards the end of my master's program, I stayed at Utah State. Um, towards the end of my second year, uh, a job posting opened up that I was brought, brought to my attention at the Richfield Public Library in Richfield, Utah. Um, now, uh, I was, again, dumb enough to apply because they said, master's degree or equivalent was preferred. And I know that job posting is everywhere. Uh, I thought to myself, I almost have a master's degree in history. So that's kind of equivalent, right? Master's is a master's. And I have all these two years of experience working at USU. And so that's got to be the equivalent experience they're looking for right there. Um, so I was dumb enough to apply to the Richfield Public Library, and they were dumb enough to hire me, which has been kind of a theme. USU was dumb enough, and now Richfield's been dumb enough to hire me. And so my first real library job was that as a director. Uh, I was the director of this library in Richfield, Utah, for a little while there. Um, and that's when I really learned what library work really was. I learned that collection development actually meant something that we had to do stuff. I learned about programming. I learned about outreach. I learned about um, how to deal with library boards and city councils and the mayor and was kind of baptized by fire for all of these things that I didn't quite know about. Um, what then happened uh, was my wife was originally from Eastern Idaho and she told me we kind of had an understanding that if a job anywhere in Eastern Idaho ever opened up, that I should apply for it. About two and a half years into my directorship at the Richfield Public Library, uh, a job opened up at the Idaho Commission for Libraries. Um, and so I, again, taking all two and a half years of my experience as a library director said, you know what? I've got 
all this vast knowledge that I've gained in two and a half years uh, as being a library director. I, I should apply for this job. I know how to work with boards. I've done the annual report twice, and that's what they wanted was someone to do the stats. Um, and so I applied, and just like USU was dumb enough to hire me and Richfield was dumb enough to hire me, the Idaho Commission for Libraries, thankfully, was dumb enough to hire me as now. So now, as an accidental librarian, I still don't have my MLS. Uh, I get to help other accidental librarians throughout the state, uh, specifically in Southeast Idaho, learn their job responsibilities and work better to uh, serve their people, serve the customers that they have that they work with. Uh, so that's my a little bit of my background there. So what exactly is a librarian? Um, in his book, Our Enduring Values, Librarianship in the 21st Century, uh, a man named Michael Gorman defines a librarian as a person who earns a master's level education at an accredited school and receives on-the-job training, as well as carrying out one or more of these tasks, selecting materials, acquiring, organizing, all of that stuff. But there are those of us uh, listening today, myself specifically, who do all those things and more, but don't have the right letters after our names and our email signatures. Uh, aren't we librarians too? And I'd argue that yes, we are. You are librarians. Uh, so what do librarians really need to know? We should know the philosophy, theory, principles, and techniques of acquiring, collecting, organizing, retrieving, and disseminating information, how to apply them and adapt them to constantly changing environments. We need to wow. know the role of <laughs> we need to know the role of computers, the internet, and emerging technologies in libraries. We need to know basic library material resources in all formats and how to use them, uh, methods and techniques for researching, analyzing, and synthesizing. We need to know reference interviewing techniques, community needs assessment methods, library planning processes, of course budgeting. Uh, we need to know our policy creation and development methods. We need to know management. Uh, and the list keeps growing. That's the worst part. Uh, and so it kind of makes you just feel like this. It can be overwhelming, absolutely, knowing all of those things. And I still am wanting to go back and get my degree to learn all these things. It can absolutely be overwhelming if that's what librarians need to know. So I'd argue that librarians really need to know just three things. Um, I'm telling you this at the risk of greatly oversimplifying. Uh, but let's talk about what it is that librarians, especially us accidental librarians, need to know. So based on the time that we have today, this is obviously going to be a short general list. But first of all, you need to know that you have got this. You can be, but you don't have to be a trailblazing pioneer. Many people have come before you. We stand on the shoulders of giants, and we should use their expertise to better ourselves, our libraries, and our communities. So find that book, find that mentor, know that you're, you've got this and you're not alone at all. The second thing, uh, all libraries should actually know something that they do teach at library school, believe it or not. Um, but the five laws of library science is a theory proposed, uh, apologies beforehand for butchering his name, uh, but it was proposed by S.R. Ranganathan in 1931. And it details the principles of operating a library system. First, uh, basically just talks about that preservation and storage are important, but the purpose of both is to promote the use of our collection. Without user access to materials, there's little value in your materials themselves. Uh, second, a library's books have a place in the collection, even if a smaller demographic might choose to read them. Third, librarians serve a wide variety of patrons, so we should acquire items to fit a vast collection of needs and not judge what they choose to read. Uh, fourth, people should be able to easily locate the materials they want quickly and efficiently. And last, a library should be continually a continually changing institution. It should be updated over time. We're not storage facilities. Uh, that's not why we're here, but we're here to have those uh, collections be updated and growing. And the third thing that we need to know and keep track of uh, in our minds is that you're not alone. Those same people who have gone before you are willing to help you out. Uh, people at your state and provincial libraries and associations 
we want to see you succeed. Um, is there anyone here who doesn't know someone at their state or provincial library that they can reach out to? Again, with the hand raise. <laughs> Just one, that's not bad. Just one? All right, yeah. I can't see who's raising hands, but if you will get with me, email me after, we will find you someone where you're at. Um, because yes, I work in Idaho and Chris works in Nebraska and it still doesn't matter because we're gonna find you someone who you can work with mm -hmm. wherever you're at. So email me, chat, uh, whatever works best. My contact information will be on the last slide and we will find you someone. Thank you. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit about some of the tools of the trade that we do have. We want to talk about a few different aspects of the day-to-day -day part of running a library. I'm assuming that's why you're all here, not to hear my awesome background, uh, but to give you a few tools that you can use to feel more comfortable doing your job. So what we're going to do is we'll go through each of these and we'll listen to my spiel and then we will open it up. Uh, this is when it's going to be you either chatting or talking through. Uh, and so we'll go through each section and then after, after my spiel on each section is when we will open it up and have everyone else share what has worked for them. So my, my first thoughts on collection development. Uh, first of all, again, since we're, we're not in this alone, we should either create or locate or update our collection development policies. Policies are so important for everything, yes. Um, and a good collection development policy, of course, it's going to be individualized for your community, for your, if you're a school or an academic or rural, uh, you want it personalized for the library and the patrons that you serve. Uh, it can include, doesn't have to, but it can include things like the library's mission statement, the purpose of the policy, uh, maybe a profile of your community or your community's information needs, uh, a description of your library's collection, uh, general collection policy, uh, which would include things like the age of materials that you collected, uh, what formats are you collecting them in, what do you do with multiple copies or what different languages do you collect items in, how are your materials funded, things like that. Um, you're also going to want to include your selection criteria. Uh, what do you do or do you take suggestions for purchase or is it all just up to the selector? Um, a section on collection maintenance, so how do you weed, how do you repair things? What do you do with replacements? Do you replace anything at all? Um, what do you do with donations? What subject areas are collected? And of, and of course, some collection assessment information so that you can say, hey, how are we going to continually look at our, our collection over time to make sure that we are fulfilling our needs of our patrons? Uh, when you do weed, uh, look at one section of shelves at a time uh, and you're going to pick your section, look at the use, look at the turnover rate, the circulation rate, and what's also really useful is if you will look at the ILL stats for items in that, both going out and then if you have to uh, interlibrary loan items in that would fit in that section. Uh, also, you're going to visually scan the section for appearance, make recommendations for acquisitions and weeding, and then most importantly, you're going to move on to the next section. So, um, and then I also have a couple tips, uh, just a few, I guess, for being a good selector. So, of course, review your collection development policy for currency and accuracy. Uh, and you're going to want to read reviews in a variety of publications by a wide range of reviewers. Uh, you can look into subscriptions to the Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, Booklist, and the New York Times Book Review. Uh, also, consult bibliographies and core collections. What are things that every library everywhere needs to have? Um, and then also know what's going on in the world and in your community read the paper, uh, go to town and council meetings, or at least read their minutes, uh, listen to NPR. And remember, uh, if you get nothing else out of this for collection development, that you should avoid coming to gut conclusions about what subjects or genres your community members are or aren't interested in, and abandon the just get what you like 
uh, method. Uh, make sure that you're representing all points of view. So those are some tips that have worked for me uh, over the years and what I've seen work for other libraries. What do you have, uh, as far as collection development, what do you use to get uh, get the materials that you need? How are you best weeding? How are you up maintaining your collections? We'll open that up to everyone. Yeah, so this is where you this is where you start you contribute. Uh, so type into the questions section in your GoToWebinar interface what you um, um, what your thoughts are on it, or if you have a microphone that you know works, that's key, and you want to use, uh, raise your hand and I'll mute you, and you can share what you're doing that way. Uh, now, I do have a question myself. Now, I'm not sure if this is where um, you would recommend putting this in. Um, what about challenges, book challenges? Absolutely. Uh, a challenge materials policy should also be included uh, in your policy manual. Um, and some people, some libraries will put it into their collection development. Some will put it into circulation. Some will put it into patron code of conduct. But it's absolutely okay. an important policy that should be there. Uh, regardless yeah. of where it's at. I was wondering, because it, it's hard, because I'm trying to see, you know, where do libraries put that, and I've seen it in in various, it depends, I guess, where you think about it in the work, in your work, in your work day. You know, in the well. workflow, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right, that should be included somewhere. Yeah. So, people trying to, so, so please type in and say, where are you finding out how you, how do you do your collection development in your libraries? Type in and let us know. Um, raise your hand, I can unmute you. Um, where are you? Um, finding materials. Um, now, if someone does not have a policy, uh, do what's the best way to get started with um, working on that one? Um, I know some of, some of our libraries in Nebraska, not all of them, do have their policies posted on their websites. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, my first suggestion would be that you find that person at your state or provincial library. That is one of the hats that I wear is as the public library consultant is I help people draft or revise their policies or point them in the direction of other libraries, like you said, that do have them online. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's why we're here. That's why we have a job is to help you do those yes. things that way. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, we do that here, here too in Nebraska for Nebraska libraries. We have a couple of uh, we have a, li a, li a public library director's guidebook um, online, like an online manual, and one for our library boards as well that has some of that information and links to good resources and tips and tricks about it. And um, looking at what other libraries have done sometimes is a lot of you know find a library that's similar to yours, similar in size. Yeah. Um, similar in population, um, who they serve, and um, see what they are doing. Um, and that's something, too, I think, um, if you don't know who at the state library or you're not sure about talking to someone, um, other librarians, we want to share with each other. So even just yep. reaching out to someone who you know is in a town that's similar to yours um, and asking them um, for their advice and networking with them would be a good way to get some ideas as well, I think. And one more, uh, you mentioned size. I would also look at type of library too. So in Idaho, for example, public libraries, there's three different types that can be established, either city libraries, district libraries, or school community libraries. And they mm -hmm. all have different laws that go along with that type. And so uh, mm -hmm. if you're going to reach out to someone, uh, it's also smart to reach out to that same type of library yeah. and, yeah. and follow, follow their lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we do have a question here um, that has come up actually. Um, ah, how do you decide, and this would be something that for you Patrick to answer, but also anyone else who's on um, logged in, um, give your answer as well to type in here um, to answer this person's question to let us know how you've done it. How do you decide whether to add a book as a print book versus an ebook or both? Mm. I want to see what other people say first. <laughs> Yeah, so let us know. How do you decide whether you're going to get something? Is it going to be print? Is it going to be ebook? Um, do you do both? What about audiobooks? Just to make it more confusing. <laughs> yeah, um, more how do you right decide that. where um, that's all going to come from? 
Okay, and then we have another, sorry, I'm reading another comment that came in at the same time, so it's something different. So, so um, while I'm reading this one, um, start entering, you know, what do you, how do you guys decide between doing print versus ebook at your libraries? What is your decision-making process for that? Um, do you just do one? Do you do the other? Do you do both? Um, do you have some sort of a policy written out that explains if it's this, we do it this way. If it's that, we do it that way. Um, but meanwhile, this person has a description of how they do some of their collection development. I have an assistant who does most of our book buying in person at Barnes & Noble. Um, however, we have our newest employee has made some very good recommendations, and we have since added graphic novels and um, manga to our collection. Cool. We have gone to the internet, to eBay, and found some excellent deals. eBay, that's an interesting one. Allowing us to purchase, adding, and complete sets. Yeah, lots of these graphic novels or manga are like long runs of things, and it's hard to get a hold of them. That's a good idea, a good recommendation. Go to eBay and look for um, things that people who were previous collectors may be sharing or selling. Yep. Going back to that, how do you decide? My first thought was cost. Um, yeah. Obviously, everyone everyone has enough money. They never need any more. But <laughs> if you're one of those few libraries that is a little low on funds, then it really comes down to cost. Um, a lot of libraries in Idaho, uh, for the most part, if they have e-collections, it's done through a consortium. It's not done on mm -hmm. the individual library side there. So they can make those suggestions that way to the consortium uh, to add that format that way uh, but audios uh, versus print let's say you're buying either one of those that really uh, that's going to come down to individual policy and what you do I mean even even something as simple as do we get the old book on tape or do we get a newer format of CD uh, the CD is going to be more expensive than buying this used on eBay or Amazon somewhere but it mm -hmm. really is the format decision that your policy is going to be written by either your your board or yourself. Yeah. Um, so we do have a couple of uh, suggestions from people here about how to do it. Um, we only purchase physical books. We offer OverDrive, mm -hmm. um, so that we, but do not have eBooks available. So as OverDrive for the audio, and they're, I think of the uh, um, information, their town population is 1300. So quite a small lo um, location. And another library says, we have Hoopla Digital. And it has Ooh, been nice. a policy that if the book was on Hoopla, we would prefer they go there rather than purchasing the book. So it's already in there. Um, uh, some else here, and we also we have a group subscription here, a, a consortium for uh, Overdrive in Nebraska as well. Um, ebook versus book versus audiobook is often decided by our patrons that we're reading them and in which format they prefer. Hmm. They would, if they want it in a particular one, they'd say, well, then if that's what we want, we'll try and get it. How um, smart to actually listen to your patrons. <laughs> that's an idea. That's awesome. Yeah. And all right, uh, Debbie, I see you raised your hand. I'm going to unmute you and see if you have a microphone there. Debbie, Lewiston City Library, I see you just typed in. Did you have a microphone as well or no? Yeah. All right. That's okay. Um, she says um, we tend, and this is in Idaho. This is your state, uh, Lewiston yep. City Library. We tend to I'll purchase more. Next week. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to purchase more books as our CD collection is not checked out as much, but we do try to purchase bestsellers. So in the other format, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's a part of it. Remembers you're looking at your usage. So yeah. Part to look um, at that. Yeah, and then we do have another one for, um, library typed in about their. Um, collection development policy in general. Um, Omaha Public Library here in Nebraska uses various input for collection development. We have an adult collection manager and a youth collection manager do a lot of research and management of community requests via handwritten requests at branches, the request an item option on the website. They have Biblio Commons so they can request there. And companies like Baker and Taylor who provide our lease materials make suggestions based on popular demand for the new releases coming. Right, your, your vendors are gonna say, hey, we know this one's gonna be potentially popular. Um, we allow yeah, that people- was something, oh, excuse me. No, that ahead. was something that I used a lot as a director is those Baker and Taylor manuals that come with the star or the bold number or whatever saying we expect this to be popular. That mm -hmm. was how I, especially coming from the academic side of thing, uh, leisure reading wasn't a thing. People only read because the professor told them to put it on. Yeah. So learning all of it that way, the vendors actually can help. They're not 
all out to get you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we allow patrons to reserve copies of books that have yet to be released, and we add temporary items to the collection um, at a minimum of four holds for copy. Um, we take donations that are in excellent condition to add to collection as well. We pay particular attention to the geographic area and the needs of the immediately surrounding community. That's what you're saying. Look at what your community, yeah. Um, and then here's a good question answer to the um, ebook versus print book. Um, um, and this is good that we're talking about. We do have some people here online that are from academic. That academic libraries tend to lean more towards ebooks since some of their students travel. Um, for study abroad or games or taking their classes remotely, doing online. So um, um, that is a good thing to, to think about too, is like where are your patrons going to be using your materials from? Yeah, I know there's a lot of libraries that um, will have, the, at least that I've been around, there's trucking companies. And so they know that their yeah. patrons are big into audiobooks more than reading because they'll get those for the long haul that they've got going on. And so they have in their collection in their collection development policy, they rely heavily on purchasing more audios than they do physical, mm -hmm. just because of their patron base. So That's a lot it. of it is just knowing who your community is. Yeah. Um, oh, and also the lover says it if you they. Um, hold two formats, having both formats it helps patrons, or putting in order for both versions helps patrons get access to a non-paper copy faster if they don't want to wait so long for the actual paper mm -hmm. copy. So that's something to think about too. Are your library, are your users willing to take that? Do they not care? Whichever is the quickest. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's definitely something. Yeah. All right, lots of good thoughts. Well, good. Let's, okay. uh, let's keep the train rolling. rolling. Are we, are, do we have any unanswered questions as far as this goes? No. Not at okay. Yeah, good so yet. let's go on to the next one. At the very end, we'll, we'll take some time. If something hits you, we'll hit those questions again. But let's move on now to reader. Oh, I need to move this. Let's move on now to reader's reference. Yeah. And as Patrick's talking you through, feel free to start typing in your thoughts and comments and things. You don't have to wait till he's done. And I'll just start reading them off after he's done his, um, his little bit. Yeah, because I can't see the questions come in, so just go. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> um, but reader's reference or reader's advisory, all kinds of libraries provide those reader's advisory services, whether they're school, academic, public. Um, these services are what we use to help match the library customer with the materials they want. Uh, reader's advisory also promotes the library and reading and encourages the concept of the library as a community center and of course they can increase your circulation, which if you have to report your circulation annually to say the state data coordinator uh, in Idaho, who is me or whatever state you're in, then having those circulation numbers are always important. Um, it's important to remember that reader's reference uh, is not format specific, which means that it can be challenging. I don't care who you are, no librarian can know enough about the collection and the customers to make good recommendations to everyone all the time. The longer you do work in a particular library, the more familiar you become with its customers and their reading preferences, well, then the better you'll be at Reader's Advisory, but it does take time. And so, first of all, you should give yourself a break understanding that it's going to take time. Um, but ways that you can help yourself out, make learning the collection in all formats a priority. And the best way that you can do that is read books and listen to CDs uh, even just reading tables of content help. Uh, watch movies, listen to audios, whatever. Um, also, you can monitor those bestsellers lists, read reviews, and know uh, what the popular reading club selections are, and then listen to author interviews and book review podcasts. And remember, if you're lucky enough, I'm sure there are some single-person libraries, but if you're lucky enough to work with others at your library, work with them on this as well. You can keep reading logs with short notes about books and feedback from not only your other staff, but library users. You can ask your library users to make comments about what they're currently reading and watching. One thing that I've seen work really well for this is that you keep some blank index cards at the desk just for that purpose so that they can fill out, hey, I just read this, it was awesome, or hey, I just read this, it was the worst thing ever and a waste of my time. Uh, but all feedback is good feedback as far as reader's advisory goes. 
Um, you can use the library's website if you have one to recommend books. Uh, you can create lists of materials similar to current bestsellers, so those read-alikes. Um, and of course, discuss new materials and the kind of readers who might enjoy them at staff meetings. Uh, if you do have more than one staff member at your library, then remember that you are lucky enough that you don't have to know, you don't have to like everything either. If you are, if you can't stand fantasy and science fiction, but there's someone on staff who that's all they read, then you obviously can tap into them and work together so that you can know the basics just through them. That's what those lists and talking back and forth can help out with. So again, what have you guys seen works well for readers reference? Yeah, so go ahead and share share what have you done or what has worked for you? Um, I, 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 I know it's always been one of the difficult things is I can't read everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I like the idea because I know like at, at bookstores sometimes there's the um, it's just something I thought of there's the the managers recommended and they have the little blurb oh, yeah. they on the shelf. Um, and I know, I'm sure, I know libraries have done this for their staff, but uh, maybe something uh, similar to that of the patrons recommended. And like you said, have a patron either tell you or write down what they thought of the book, ask them if they'd be willing to have it. And it could even be done anonymously if they wanted to. Can we share this on this display we want to put up and say, so one of your, you know, community members, one of your, um, you know, people thought this about this book. You know. And those staff pick shelves are also ways that people learn the staff, right? And they say, I, mm -hmm. you know, Beth and I have the same reading interests. And so then I see Beth working in the library and I know, hey, she's someone that I can maybe have a conversation to or yeah. talk about the latest book or get a suggestion from her. Yeah, I am. And I just found out that the, she is into this, the fantasy. I didn't know that. Great. Now I know who I can go to whenever I want more ideas because I saw her name on the thing on the shelf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. We've got some uh, comments coming in here now. In the children's fiction collection, um, the director and the assistant director put a small colored sticker on the spine of books we like. The patrons can then just scan books for the stickers. So for, for kids, yeah, rather than having something written out that they have to read, just um, look at the ones that have the stickers. Those are the recommended ones from the, the um, library staff for the kids' books. And it can do the same thing if you don't like them. Uh, don't like the pics from the director, then you avoid those stickers. So yeah, you know, we're yeah. still providing reference, right? Yes, people have different um, uh, opinions on books, and that's okay. Some people like yep. one book, and other people hate it totally. <laughs> um, oh, read a likes. That's a good thing, too, to look up things that are read a likes. And this person recommends a site called Fantastic Fiction has helped for read a likes to help for children and adult fiction. So if you know that you found out that you, if, if you, you know, you've seen this at the store, at the bookstore too, if you like this one, try this one. Things like that are available online, yeah. Um, I also and know. Novelist, yeah, Novelist has that as well. If you subscribe or you're, like here in Nebraska, we subscribe to that for our, our libraries at the state. Um, Novelist has the read-alikes too. I was going to put a plug in for Idaho's Novelist subscription as well. Yeah, so do, yeah. I can at least vouch for our state and you can vouch for yours. <laughs> and. We'll find the other states as we go. Yeah, check and see what group or statewide consortium things your your state is offering for you. Um, and someone else says we are driven by patron recommendations. That's yeah. Listening to your patrons. Talk I to love them, it. chat, be friendly, just say what did you think of this book when they return it, or when you're just wandering the stacks, hanging out with them, or whatever. Um, yeah, this one, uh, this person says we have a staff of about 20 and we lean on each other. And um, so, um, and so, so and so likes fantasy and me being in youth services, I'm called upon to suggest, suggest kids books. So that's the thing too. If you have somebody who comes up to you and wants to know a particular topic that you don't know, I think it's okay to say, you know what, that's not my folk, I don't know much about that, but I do know so-and-so does over here, let me go bring them to you, or bring you to them to ask them, because they are the expert in that field, so to speak. It's totally fine to not know everything. Yes. <laughs> um. Oh, ooh, this is a cool idea too. Um, we have a young adult book recommendation display. 
So they let the um, young adults, the teens, pull their favorite books, put a star bookmark in the book, and put it on display. So having the actual patrons the, do the display oh, nice. that way, yeah. So these are ones your other teens, just like you, have to like this book. Good crowdsourcing idea, too, yeah. to get your patrons involved. I like that a lot. Interaction with them, yeah. They give them ownership of the library too. Like it's for us, and we help contribute to it too. Got anything else coming in? Because we can move on yeah. if there. Yeah, let's go on to the next topic. Okay, so our next one we wanted to talk about was outreach. Um, uh, my Idaho people might recognize the Fremont County Bookmobile. They just got this. Just put the wrap on it last summer. It looks yeah. great. I love it. Uh, nice view of the Tetons from St. Anthony and Ashton. So they had to brag about that a little bit. But <laughs> by outreach, all, all I mean by outreach is outreach services is reaching people you serve who are not able to come into the library. And so that's done by things like this bookmobile or books by, books by mail, um, homebound services, nursing home services. Uh, a lot of people will go uh, and reach out to children in, in daycares or uh, at preschools and kindergartens. Um, and then, of course, we have to put a plug in for the talking book service that's provided uh, mm -hmm. nationwide. Uh, that's another way that we can reach our, reach our patrons who aren't able to come in to the library. So keeping those sorts of things in mind, what have you guys done to outreach to your patrons that aren't able to make it into the library? All right, yeah, so type in, raise your hand. I can unmute you and you can use your microphone. How have you gone out into your community? Uh, we have bookmobiles here in some, some of our cities here in Nebraska too. Um, some of our big ones and some of our little ones. Um, uh, here, ha, ah, cool, we have someone who is their bookmobile driver, awesome. Um, we go to daycares, preschools, and apartment complexes. Ooh, I like the apartment complex one. Yeah. One of the best ideas that I heard was that people will go to laundromats to do story times. Uh, there's uh, that would be great. Yes, you're always sitting in there bored. You have to bring the kids along. <laughs> they so don't want to be there. You don't even want to be there. Be <laughs> uh, all right, here we go. I got some more. Uh, we have a homebound program that vol the volunteers run. Um, oh, someone specifically, we regularly do home delivery of books to a 97-year-old patron in town, directly to their home. Awesome and individualized. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, on Fridays, we go to a town and stay most of the day and have a tech day to use the Wi-Fi and get books. That's nice. the bookmobile driver version. Mm -hmm. yep. um, home delivery for shut-ins, Head Start tour story time. Go to the Head Start for stories. Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, story times at schools and daycares. That's thing school com com um, working with the schools. I know you had mentioned um, Patrick the combination school public yeah libraries. But even if you're not officially like a combo, um, reach out to the school. They even if they have their own librarian and their own media specialist, you guys can do things back and forth together. Once the schools close, the kids need to may want somewhere to go. And if you guys are working together already, and they're you're coming to theirs, they're coming to your library. Um, they're going to see that connection. Yeah, partnerships with libraries with other libraries are not a bad thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're not in competition. Not at um, all. We are looking at starting a home delivery service, partnering with our pharmacy delivery and the senior center Meals on Wheels. Oh, that's a good, they're already going to these places. That's awesome. Um, going into the parks in the summer. Yep, going mm, outside yep. the parks. Um, to, so, and specifically partnering with Parks and Rec. Um, we do the story times and they do games. Um, Ah, um, working at a, at a um, university, um, I work in interlibrary loan and academic library at a university with a growing number of online only distance students. So um, it, it just has to be what it is. We've largely gotten by with a lot of ebooks and digital delivery articles. Um, 
but and this person does have a question and for ideas about this but I have no idea how to handle requests for print books from these online only distance students the few times we've mailed out our books it hasn't gone well and I have no idea if or how we would handle an ILL request from a distance student for a print book from another library um, that that can be done actually we actually do that here at the Library Commission the Nebraska Library Commission we actually do ILL on behalf of a lot of our small libraries in the state they don't have their own interlibrary loan accounts with OCLC mm -hmm. or whatever and you can act as a um, um, agent for them so to speak um, but even I know too, sometimes in ILL requests, you can say, I am as as our academic library, we are taking responsibility for requesting this book, but we want you to ship it. Because what we do is they don't come here. We tell them mm -hmm. we're buying we're we're just doing the behind the scenes work for it, but we want you library to loan to this library. Send it directly to them, and when they're done, they send it directly back to you and just let us know what's going on, but we handle the requesting of that. So um that is something that could be done. Um there are other distance education programs out there. That might be something we need to, you know, get you in touch with someone who does do that as as a regular thing. If that's something new that you're dealing with, is these online only students? Because I know there's libraries, academic libraries, that do um, do this already and have it figured out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and that's one of those uh, going back to our keys at the beginning is that you're not alone. Uh, you don't. Yeah, I mean, it's not a groundbreaking thing. It sounds like other people have done that. It's just a matter of pairing you up with people who have. So mm -hmm. uh, reach out afterwards and we'll help you find those other libraries that are already doing that. Yeah. Um, some other ideas. Senior centers are located across the alley from them. That's convenient. Uh, so they do movie matinees every Thursday for the seniors. Uh, someone else does a mobile maker space they can take out into the community. Smart. Awesome. There's a lot of things that are in those makerspaces. They're very transportable. Um, another one to work with, working with Meals on Wheels. Um, we have a preference sheet they can fill out, and the volunteers who deliver the meals will deliver the books as well. So reach out to your Meals on Wheels people who are already driving around to these people and just say, we just want to work with you and have the, you know, we, so you don't even need the extra person to delivery. They're already going to these places. Mm hmm um, do when you do things, oh, sorry. When you do things like that, make sure you're offering the Meals on Wheels people something as well. So it's not just please do this for us. It's this is what we can also offer you. Mm. Um, we partner with a local school district who have the summer lunch program. So they offer the, sum, the lunch programs during the summer when school's out, and they go where the free meals are set up and reach a lot of the kids there in the summertime. Ooh, take a friends group taking books to the bus station and food bank. Nice. Anywhere where people are going to be, you can go there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, perfect. Um, I know we're coming up on our hour. Yes, and that's okay. Um, yeah, I know we have a few more topics to get through, um, and I was going to mention that too. Yeah, officially we go 10 to an hour long. We did start a little after 10, so that's okay. Um, but we will keep going as long as it takes to get through all of the um, presentation that Patrick has, and any comments and questions you guys have. We will not get cut off at 11 a.m. We'll, it'll keep going. Um, if you do need to leave because you only allotted an hour of your own time for this today, that's fine. We're recording the whole thing. You can always come back and watch the rest of it later. But if you're able, able to stick around with us, please do and keep chatting. We'll go as long as it takes to get through everything that we want to discuss and all of your good ideas and suggestions. Okay. And mm -hmm. and as far as I'm concerned, I've only got a few more slides, but I really do want to hear what everyone else has. So uh, let's move on just real quick to advocacy. Uh, what I mean by advocacy is the act of pleading for or arguing in favor of something. And so in our case, obviously, it's the library. And the best way that I can explain what libraries need to market like is that libraries need to market and advocacy needs to be treated like it's mayonnaise. Um, let me explain what I mean by that, please. Um, so libraries need to market the way that mayonnaise markets. Um, Best Foods or Hellman's, uh, depending on the side of the country that you're in, same company, different name, but they advertise everywhere. 
Um, they have billboards, they have magazine ads, they have bus flyers uh, on the outside of buses, inside of buses. Uh, they actually sponsor a NASCAR hood. Uh, every now and then, if you're watching the NBA, the little scroll that goes up on the score table will have a mayonnaise ad right there. They advertise everywhere. And with all of that, I guarantee you that no one has ever been watching uh, a NASCAR race and seen the, the hood of the car drive by and said, oh, no, I need to leave and go buy mayonnaise right now or jumped <laughs> off the bus at the next stop to go to the grocery store to buy the mayonnaise that is needed. But with that in mind, I have some mayonnaise in my fridge at home, and it's actually Best Foods um, because I recognized a need. I, I was out of mayonnaise, and when I was at the grocery store, that was a brand that I was familiar with that I had seen the ads for, and I knew that that was going to fill the need that I had. Many of us I know have, uh, and myself included, uh, we've – advertised for a program and then been super disappointed that one or two or no people showed up for it. Um, and that's because we were advocating for a library or marketing for a library. Maybe we put a flyer up, maybe we went on the radio, but we did it just once. What we need to do is we need to be that constant source of, you know, the library has genealogy databases. The library has genealogy databases. And we put up flyers and we put them in the laundromat and we put them at the preschools and we talk about it on the radio and we send out our mailer once a month that talks about, hey, these things are going on. And we have flyers up at the desk so that when people come, they see, oh my goodness, they have these genealogy databases, for example. And then one day down the road, they're gonna be saying, hey, you know, I wish I knew more about my family history. Maybe there's something to this, oh my goodness. And the light bulb will go on mm -hmm. and they'll realize the library has these databases that I can use uh, or car repair manuals or whatever it is that you are promoting. We need to promote it like mayonnaise. Libraries need to be more like mayonnaise and advocate everywhere all the time. Uh, and so how are you maybe mayonnaise related, maybe not, <laughs> best able to advocate or market for your library. Yeah, share some success stories with um, how you've done some marketing um, or struggles. Maybe we can help with some of, some of those. Um, that, that's a good point that you never, you know, you, your, your program didn't go well, but you, you plant that seed. Mm -hmm. and that's the thing. They'll, when they need it, they'll remember that they saw the thing. Um, but you've got to keep keep it out there constantly. It's not just a one shot. We did a program. We put the flyers out. Nobody came. Yeah, we still have the database, but oh well. <laughs> it's got to be a constant, over and over again, repeating that this is a thing that the library has. Um, at social media works Perfect. really well for us. Someone says here we share on Facebook and patrons share, share, share. <laughs> So, so they share it and then their patrons um, repeat it. So that's the thing too. If you're sharing things out on your pages or on your Twitter or your Instagram or whatever it is, you, you know, the, the social media app of the day, uh, um, <laughs> then, you know, hopefully your patrons will also reshare those things and get the word out, you know, the trickle down theory that does work. <laughs> Any other advocacy ideas you've done, ways of marketing your programs or marketing the library in general, that it's a good resource uh, for people to go to? Ah, okay. Doing things that look, uh, doing flyers and handouts and um, things, bookmarks that look professional and attractive. Um, this um, library says they have a Canva account. Oh, um, perfect. A great resource um, if you're not a graphic designer with, like me, <laughs> or like many of us, but you've got to put out something that isn't the clip art that we've still we've still used from the 90s. <laughs> um, it is great. You can go in there with an idea and a thought, and it will. You know, what do you want? Do you want a bookmark? Do you want a flyer? Do you want a banner for your Facebook page? Um, and it will help you figure out and find things that it has links. It has information in there that is um, allowable photos and things that you can use. Um, this person just said they do have a professional account too, and I believe Canva has something for um, nonprofits, maybe. Mm -hmm. No, you're correct. They do. Okay, 
I was trying to remember if that was the one I was thinking of. Yeah. So if it looks attractive and professional, it's going to catch people's attention. So use something like that Canva, C-A-N-V-A. Go look it up. Um, oh, here's something for that you, I assume, know about, Patrick. I have posted to the Idaho community calendar. Oh, yep. There's a thing. Okay. <laughs> Um, that's a good idea too. Yeah, is there is there somewhere else where things are are promoted in your community? Is there a bulletin board at the grocery store at the post office? Is there some online resource that the city or the village runs? Get on that. Get where people are going um, to. And this is similar to the outreach that you're just talking about. Put your stuff out where your non-users are. You know where yep. you don't. You know don't just promote in your library to the people that are already coming into your library. Get out, take a handful of these flyers you made and walk around all the businesses that you can get to and ask if we can put some out, could put something in your window, whatever. And that's one of those uh, times that partnerships can really help. Um, back in back in Utah as a director there, I was lucky enough to go monthly on the morning radio show, uh, oh. on the one radio station in that town. So um, they had a what's going on at the library half an hour section at segment once a month that I because I reached out to them they let me come and do mm -hmm. oh here's a good one they talk about the, the doing the um partnering on um, this person says our bank will advertise our movie nights you know banks have those scrolling marquees and stuff yeah. the bank advertises their movie nights teen after hours all our fundraising events and I know a lot of people partner with their cities as well to put it in utility bills yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and this one says we have a portable TV where we have all of our events posted at the main entrance of the library. So a your own kind of version of electronic signage, a TV mm -hmm. or a monitor, anything out the window, right? And, you know, something more animated that catches people's attention too. Yeah. And that's the thing too, with all this advocacy, you've got to do multiple um, roads. You know, yep. you can't do the one thing. You're going to have to go to a lot of different ways. But the, the idea is you come up with one idea, one promo looking thing, one design using Canva, and then just duplicate it across all the different places. Yeah, just like Manis, it's not just on billboards. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, church bulletins. Yep. People go to church and things are in the bulletin if they allow you to put things in there. Yeah. Oh, and um, this one says, I've had good success with teen events where I copy the event flyer onto a four by four on one page, so four different ones, and cut it, hand it out to the teens, and then that little piece of paper goes home to the parents, and the parents can see what's happening as well. Oh, yeah. Well, good. Let's, let's hit on to programming now. So what we really just need to think in programming I know a lot of us public libraries, and I even use this picture, uh, but we think of programming as story times for preschool or younger kids. Um, but let's not get stuck presenting the same programs with the same presenters year in and year out. So we can ask our community members to share their hobbies or experiences. Yes. Um, we can also, uh, education programs at local museums will routinely make community presentations. So reach out to those other others in your community, uh, especially also local fire departments and police can do a show and tell on a variety of topics. Uh, you can ask veterinarians, doctors, bakeries, karate instructors, newspaper reporters, artists, musicians, authors, and TV personalities, not only to present programs, but ask them for ideas. What would they be interested in? Um, and then, of course, I mentioned it briefly, but don't forget your adults. Uh, use book discussion groups, classes on how to find health information, classes on the databases the library offers and how to use them from home, uh, computer skills for people with disabilities, computer training in basic skills such as word processing, email and spreadsheets, um, English as a second language classes, exhibits and displays, maybe a knitting group or a local author talk. I mean, any of these things would work. Uh, we're really just trying to use the library as a resource for people to learn something in these cases. And that is, those are some of the ways that I've seen work. What about you all? What have you seen? What programming has worked best for you? Yeah. 
I think and this one goes again to what is what does your community want? It's going to be very specific mm -hmm. to each of your areas. Do you are you really full of lots of kids and you need that story time? Um, uh, okay. Um, Oh, armchair travels with seniors to children who have traveled to far off places. So adults doing talks to the kids about places they've traveled to that the children have maybe have never gone to before. That's a really good idea. Good connection there, yeah. I know I've seen some libraries do where they just have someone coming in to talk about their travels, but specifically targeting it at the, to the children is a really cool idea. Mm-hmm. Um, ooh, the mobile mammogram bus is coming to the library. Cool. Mammogram bus. And paint a master masterpiece, one of those painting court classes, like you go to those oh, yeah, yeah. paint things. Yeah. Anything that, and that's the thing too, if you've seen things in potentially in, but maybe in larger towns, if you're a smaller one, that there are these um, businesses that people go to for things like doing, you know, everyone does the same painting thing or a cooking class or something, or a place that does these bring that same idea to your library. Um, sometimes you can charge for a small amount for materials or something, not necessarily as much as uh, playing for a whole course or something as you would at a business, but um, that is definitely something you can just recreate in your library for people to do. And do it as an adult thing, do it as a kid thing. Um, oh, they partnered with a local college theater professor and her students are putting on a puppet show. Ooh, that's very cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, if there's any other tools that you have that you want to share, now is the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Please share those tools with us. Um, but other than that, thank you very, very much. Uh, please, please reach out. Uh, the whole point of this presentation and this webinar today was to remind you all that you're not alone. And hopefully to hear some of the amazing things that people are doing right now to better their communities and that you can as well. So thank you, thank you. Um, that is all I had. If there's anything you guys have, let's answer questions if we have time. Yeah, we do have one question that did come up a little earlier, but then I wanted to get into some of the other topics too. If anyone does have any questions, comments, thoughts, other suggestions, ideas about anything, shoot them out there, start typing them in. We'll get them all um, right off um, and they'll be in the archive for people. So uh, someone does have a question about, does anyone, so it goes back to the um, outreach. Okay. Does anyone's library allow access to homebound services for all card holders? I know that some folks who could truly benefit shy away from using the service because of the name. They feel like they are able enough they shouldn't take advantage of it. Um, or it has to do with them wanting to maintain their dignity and pride for not to see themselves as homebound. Um, specifically, this person says, my grandmother can drive but doesn't always feel well enough to do so. I want her to feel comfortable using the service, but no matter how much I insist that it is, she won't believe that the service is for her if she knows that she can drive sometimes. That might be a name, a renaming, a remarketing of the service. Or what would be another way to promote homebound and delivery services? Does anybody have any any suggestions on that? I mean, we now have actually. I wonder if it would be even easier now. It just dawned on me. We have these. Um, food delivery services, the DoorDash. Yeah. I mean, you can get McDonald's and Taco Bell delivered to you. We have the grocery delivery services now um, where, you know, your local grocery store will come to you or like going to Walmart, you call ahead and have them do your shopping for you and you just pull in, they fill it, they put the groceries in your car and you drive away. So yeah, maybe it remarketing it in that way instead of, this is for people who physically can't get out. It's this is for people who want the convenience and so we'll bring it to you. Book dash. Book dash. Yes, that's awesome. Steal that. Book dash. <laughs> <laughs> copyright, copyright, TM, TM. <laughs> Use it. Yes, please do. I think that's, I think that's mainly what that would be is totally just rebrand and re change how you market that service so that they don't feel that it is something for people who are physically unable, it's just people that want the convenience. We all want things delivered to us. We want instant gratification. The less hassle, the better. Ordering things online rather than going to a store for some people, it's a thing. 
Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts or comments or things? Nobody's typed anything in while we were discussing this yet. So, Ali, I hope that helped you a little bit with you and your grandmother. Yeah. All right. So it doesn't look like any other desperate, urgent questions or comments have come in while we've been chatting. But that's good. All right. Yeah, so thank I you. think, yeah, we will officially wrap it up. This was great. Um, um, oh, wait. Of course, one question just comes in now. Wait a minute. Perfect. Uh, what would be the best way to get cards for patrons who can't come in? Oh, get the library card to them to be able to become a user? Um, Many libraries now I know have um, electronic versions of their cards. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a physical card, like an app on your phone. That's the actual card. Um, so give them a way to sign up for an electronic version of the library card. And I know that you could, if you're worried about getting the patron information, you could do a quick Google form to yep. gather all the information and then even just mail out the card. If you're wanting to get that physical card to them, uh, that's also oh, a way yeah. to do it. Actually, as someone just said, yeah, library cards by mail. Just do it by mail. They don't have to come in. I got a Houston public library card by filling out an online form and they mailed me a physical card. Yeah, so have them do the online form. It says, thank you, good answer. Thank you for that. And the person who asked about the homebound services says, yes, thank you, those are all good ideas too. Perfect. So yeah, you can totally do that by mail. It doesn't have to be, and this would be a policy thing if you have a policy of how people apply for and get cards, get mm -hmm. your library cards, change it and just create a, we do. We will do it by mail. We will send it to you physically by mail. Just do this form. And, yep, yeah. policies can actually absolutely change. Of course, and you should change them, keep them up to date for whatever you need to do. Yeah. All right, anything else anyone wants to ask before we do we do wrap it up? Um, you can type in your questions there. You can reach out to me. As um, Patrick said, he's at Idaho, I'm here in Nebraska. We are the state um, commissions for each of, our live, each of our states. Look for the one in your state um, for more um, help with all these kind of things. And please do. All right. So thank you everyone for attending and being so so chatty today. This is great. I know I think Patrick, you said this is the first time you've done this particular presentation as a webinar. Yeah, it worked out great, I think. I'm glad it worked. Yes, I know we, we do get some good um, conversations on our show usually. So that's that's great. I was glad we could get some great ideas for you and for everyone on the show. I hope you got some good tips and tricks here um, for how you can be um, your best accidental librarian you can be. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. All right. So I am going to pull back presenter control to my screen here. Yes. To, to wrap up for today. Um, and do, 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 one, two, there we go. All right. So, oops, over here. so that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, this is the page for today's show. But if we go to our main page, for Encompass Live, if you do just Google or use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, so far we are the only thing called that on the internet. Nobody can use our name. <laughs> so <laughs> you just Google Encompass Live, you will find our main page and our archive page. This is our upcoming shows for the next couple of months for the rest of the year. But to find the recording, so please do sign up for any of these coming up. But find the recordings, we have a link right under here at the bottom called Archived Encompass Live Shows. Today's show will be at the top of the list. Most recent ones are at the top of the list. And we will have a link to our recording and a link to the presentation. Um, I don't know if you were going to send me that, Patrick. I know it was mostly just screenshots, but um, or, uh, I think it's going to do the PDF of that just for... Yeah, I'll get that to you today. Yeah. So you'll have it. So we'll have a link to both of those there. Everyone who attended today and registered for today's show, even if you didn't attend live, will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is available and ready here on our site. Hopefully by the end of the day today, if GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me <laughs> for the day. Um, <laughs> While we're here, I'll, sh I'll just mention our archives. This is our the archives for the entire history of Encompass Live. We do have where you can search the entire archives or just the most recent 12 months. And that is because Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. 
we've been a little over 10 years and we have all of our shows here on this long, long list. So you can search on any topic you want to and you will find things going back to the beginning of the show. But if you want something very current, just limit your search to the most recent 12 months. You just get that. Um, but if for anything you search on here, um, there is a date of when the show is originally broadcast. So definitely pay attention to that. Um, when you are watching something, you will find things here that may be old, outdated information, services and products that have changed or maybe don't exist anymore. Um, you never know. So just pay attention to the original broadcast date. Some things, though, are eternally good, like summer reading program reading lists. Books of good books for kids and teens are always going to be good. But some things may be, you know, older. So just pay attention to that when you are going through our archives. Um, but we are librarians. This is what we do. We do archive things for historical purposes for certain reasons. Things, and this is something we will always do as long as um, the Internet is out there to help do that for us. <laughs> Um, we also do have a Facebook page. When I um, put do announcements about the show and the recordings, we post to our Facebook page, our Twitter. Someone was mentioning social media. We have mailing lists here in Nebraska. So if you are a big Facebook user, um, please do give us a like over on Encompass Live. We link to that from our page. Here's a reminder about logging in. Today's show is on there. Um, our previous shows are on here. Um, so two or three times a week, I send something out onto our Facebook page. You can also follow our hashtag NCUMPLive as abbreviation on Twitter, where we post things there. So um, that will wrap it up for today. Um, hope you join us. Next week's show is um, a local program, Nebraska Extension's Read for Resilience program. Um, this is um, from our Nebraska Extension program through the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Um, they're early childhood extension educators specifically, and this is programming for um, children who have um, has been a, here in Nebraska and across the country. We had major uh, weather disasters this past year. You may have heard about the entire state flooded um, and it's still having problems and children are having struggling dealing with that. They've got for a new program specifically for helping children deal with these kind of disasters and emotional and, and uh, traumatic events. Their Read for Resilience program. So um, Holly, Amy, and Linda from there will be with me next week to talk about that. Um, so this is all things are on their website. Um, obviously it is Nebraska specific, but anyone can use their resources on the page too. So please do sign up and join me for that and any of our other upcoming shows we have here for the rest of the year. Um, as I add new ones on, they get added to our list and this is what we've got confirmed for now. So that wraps up for today. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Patrick, for joining me. This is great. You, awesome. We got this out here. So many accidental librarians, as, you, as we saw from those hand raising at the beginning and who has the degree and who doesn't, Mm -hmm. It leans more, and this here leans more to the not than having. <laughs> and that's what we're here for. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.